Of the many religions and belief systems in the world today, only three are united in their belief in a single omnipotent God who created the universe and offers salvation to his children. With such close family ties, it would seem that relations between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam would be benign and peaceful. But as is true in many families, there are points of deep disagreement. Today, we will try to unravel the complex history and relationship between the world's three great religions, their view of God and each other. Hello, I'm Carolyn Morrison, and welcome to another episode of Mysteries of the Church. The concept of monotheism, or belief in one single all-powerful God, is very important in all three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And this was very different from the societies um, in which each of them developed, which worshipped in general many different gods and goddesses. The idea that you could have one single all-powerful God um, in control of all human affairs um, was essentially a revolutionary message. Monotheism is the belief that there is only one God, and this is one of the things, the beliefs that these three faith practices, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism believe in. They believe in one God, not one God above other gods, but only one God. And one of the beautiful things about it is they all believe in the same one God. According to Judaism, according to Christianity, and according to Islam, Abraham, uh, our ancestor in faith, our common ancestor in faith, was the first to have believed in one and only one God. One of the things to remember, again, when we look at these three great monotheistic religions of the world, we are worshiping the same God. We may call that God by different names, we may call that God Yahweh. We may call that God Allah, but it is the same God. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all recognize this one central God as the creator and sustainer of all life and the universe. They recognize God as the ultimate judge of human beings. Um, and they all believe that worship of this one God is a critical element of their faith in addition to loving one's neighbor. So for Jews, for Christians, and for Muslims, God speaks, as it were, in the human language of revealed books. Uh, Islam, for instance, speaks of Jews and Christians as peoples of the book and respects the way in which God has disclosed God's will for human beings in the Bible. What we would call the Old Testament, or the Bible, as I prefer to call it the Bible, is the foundation for the New Testament, or the Gospels and the Epistles, and also for the Koran. But if you believe in the Koran, you still believe in the Gospels, as well as in the Bible. And if you believe in the Gospels and in the New Testament, you also believe in the Old Testament, or the Bible. So these three religions are literally joined at the hip and they all accept the same basic scriptures. Although, as we can see, the differences are because they add layers, new scriptures, to their beliefs. There's several differences between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And for us to say there are no differences really would be, again, disingenuous. We would have to say that there are substantial differences. Let's just start, for instance, between Judaism and Christianity. The most obvious one is that Judaism is still waiting for their Messiah. We believe that that Jewish Messiah came, and he came as Christ Jesus. And it may be interesting for Christians to learn, therefore, that Jesus is also a very important figure in Islam. Jesus is recognized as a prophet and as a messenger. 
And the difference is that a prophet is someone who receives a revelation from God. A messenger is someone who is guaranteed the success of their revelation. And in the Islamic tradition, there are only five messengers, Abraham, Noah, Moses, Jesus, and Muhammad. So now we know that although there are root similarities between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we also know that there are significant differences. In the next segment, we will find out how and why these differences came about. So stay with us. Mysteries of the Church will be right back. Although the Holy Scriptures of Judaism, Christianity and Islam all include a version of the Old Testament, Christianity and Islam have each added their own later books of Holy Revelation. For Christians, this is the New Testament. For Muslims, it is the Quran. All three faiths believe the Old Testament directive that it is our duty to obey God through worship, prayer and moral living. So how did each of these three great monotheistic religions come about? When we look to the Bible, we have the first five books of the Old Testament. The Jewish people call that the Torah. We as Christians call it the Pentateuch. And it's so, so key that we all understand that the roots of both Christianity and Judaism are found within these first five sacred books. In the religion of Israel, the promise is made to Abraham that his descendants will live forever and they will have a land given to them by God. Another layer is added at the time of Moses when they leave Egypt and re-enter this land. The Decalogue is revealed to Moses, the Ten Commandments, these ten basic laws of how the Lord wants the people to live. The first three, all about the relationship with God. The last seven, all about the relationship with humanity. Uh, how, how should we live our lives? And we see no matter what happens, it's always this dynamic tension of the covenant. We find the God of the, the, the Hebrew people is a God who is very just, very mighty, um, very forgiving, but in a very sort of fatherly way. Uh, the, the Hebrew people are sort of the children. God, the father, is constantly trying to get them back on the right track again. So the story of Judaism is the story of that family, the story of that people brought by God out of slavery in Egypt to the land of promise and called by God eternally to be faithful to the covenant. And one can consider the faith of Israel to be crystallized with the establishment of the kingdom of David. Then we have the Davidic Messiah, the, the idea that somebody from the line of David will always be on the throne of Israel. We have the destruction of the material kingdom and the Messiah becomes ethereal and spiritual. And so the God of Israel moves through history and it's always gradually the promise of salvation, this promise of a Messiah. Exile after exile, they're conquering by the Babylonians, the Assyrians, the conquering by the, the Greeks, and eventually by the Romans. It's all there and it all logically leads up to Christ. When we approach the issue of the connection between Judaism or the religion of Israel and Jesus Christ, we have to recognize that Jesus was never a Christian. Jesus lived and died as a pious Jew. And it was his followers that gave him a role in what we would call the religion of Israel that eventually proved to be just the thing that Jews could not accept. And that one thing was that Jesus was the Messiah. The Jewish people are looking for a Messiah, an anointed leader that they felt God was going to send them so we have many different ideas of who this Messiah is going to be. Is he going to be a political leader like King David? Is he going to be a suffering servant? In Jesus' lifetime, he wasn't the only one claiming 
that he was Messiah. Most probably among the Jewish religious leaders of his day, most of them probably saw Jesus as just one more person claiming to be this long-awaited Messiah. And they probably saw him as his upstart, someone who was going about changing the, the ways of day-to-day -day life in Israel, changing the ways of the worship of God. And they would find some of his concepts just so radically opposed, not a fulfillment, but a discontinuity with uh, Judaism. Jesus was born and was raised and learned the faith of his ancestors, which was Judaism. The first followers of Jesus were likewise Jews. And Jesus says, Jesus himself says in Matthew's Gospel, that he hasn't come to abolish the Torah. He hasn't come to abolish anything. In fact, he's come instead to fulfill. One could argue the religion of Israel, in which Jesus was a participant and a believer along with the first apostles, was the religion that was then the basis for two new religions, Judaism on the one hand rejecting Christ as Messiah and Christianity accepting him as Messiah. We're likewise taught that the church has her beginnings in the event of Pentecost, where after the death and resurrection of Jesus, the disciples are once again gathered and gathered together with the mother of Jesus in the upper room. And it's the Holy Spirit that empowers them to begin the work of proclaiming the gospel. Jesus talks in the words of Judaism of his time and explains that his death is going to be the moment at which the fulfillment of the messianic moment will be achieved. Seven centuries later, along comes Muhammad, who accepts the one God of the religion of Israel, interprets Jesus as a prophet who is closest to God, and accepts the words of Jesus that the end of times will come when Jesus returns on a cloud to judge the living and the dead. In terms of geographic influence, uh, what I can say for Islam, we're talking about a religion uh, that began to be revealed in the year 610 in the Common Era. The revelation of the Quran was given to one person, the Prophet Muhammad, over a period of 22 years. Uh, so we're talking about a very short time period and a revelation that's given to one person as opposed to the Bible, uh, which is revelation given to many different people over a much longer time period. When we look at the beginnings of Islam, we're looking once again at a moment of revelation. Uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was accustomed to spending time apart, was accustomed to spending time on a mountain in meditation and in prayer. And we're told that it was during such a time of meditation and prayer that the angel Gabriel, that the archangel Gabriel appears to the prophet and begins the revelation of the Holy Quran to the prophet Muhammad. Now, the area around where Muhammad was, was an area that was populated by many people with uh, natural religions, animism, for instance. There were some Christians, there were some Jews. So it was a very multicultural, multi-religious area. So he was familiar with all these religions. Was he an expert in them? I'm sure he wasn't. But he was at least as familiar as we kind of are in our pluralistic society today. Muhammad never wanted to start a religion. It's curious, he's very much like Jesus, who never wanted to start a new religion. He wanted to reform the existing Abrahamic religion in a way that would communicate with its time and avoid the contradictions that had beset it historically by abuse, by institutions, by bad behavior. So he starts to build a community of believers, and this is when he and this community of believers sort of get run out of Mecca. They move to Medina. He grows a community of believers in Medina, and this becomes um, the beginning of Islam, which means surrender, surrender to God, um, and sees itself as a very true monotheistic religion. So each of the world's three great monotheistic religions seem to have been a natural outgrowth of those which came before it. But on which theological points do they agree? And on which do they disagree? 
And how has this complicated interfaith relations over the centuries? We'll find out when Mysteries of the Church returns. We have already learned that Christianity and Islam each accept the Old Testament as the holy book of the Jews and the foundation of their faith in one God. We have found that Islam also accepts many details of Christ's message and life, although they do not accept that he has yet revealed himself as the Messiah. But are there other, broader points on which the world's three greatest monotheistic religions agree and if such points of agreement exist, do they help bring Judaism, Christianity, and Islam closer together or drive them further apart? There's an amazing amount of things that all the Abrahamic religions believe in. We can conceive of them as layers so that everything in the religion of Israel is believed in by Christians and believed in by Muslims. We have the common faith ancestor of Abraham that ties Judaism, Christianity, and Islam together. And we also have many other common prophets from the Old Testament who are specifically mentioned in the Quran. The Muslim people look at the characters, many of the prophets in the Old Testament, as legitimate prophets. Um, Abraham, Moses, Noah, uh, and even some of the prophets that they look at in what we would call the New Testament or the Second Testament, Jesus, John the Baptist, um, these are people that Muslims acknowledge as messengers of God. The Islamic outlook today is that Jesus was, you know, born of the Virgin Mary. His mother was a virgin. Um, they do not believe he is the Son of God, though. He was a prophet, he's a great man, um, but they will not go so far as to say he is the Son of God. In fact, Jesus is mentioned quite often in the Quran, and when we look at the uh, story of the mother of Jesus, in fact, the Quran has a surah, has a chapter that is dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus. The Virgin Mary is very important in the Islamic tradition. Uh, we, in fact, have more information about the Virgin Mary in the Quran than we do in the entire canonical New Testament. The city of Jerusalem is considered a sacred city. We call it the Holy Land, in fact. In fact, all three of these monotheistic religions hold it as a holy and special place. Yet, interestingly enough, none of them actually originated in the city. For Judaism, Jerusalem's significance begins in as much as it becomes the capital city for David, the king. David, whom God chose to serve as king over God's people and who establishes himself in Jerusalem. It's the city where Jesus is crucified. It's the city where Jesus is raised from the dead. And for that reason, uh, Christianity builds on the sacredness of Jerusalem as the city of the temple uh, making it the city where uh, the crucial events of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. But Jerusalem is also the site of a very important mystical experience that the prophet is believed to have had, and this is called the night journey. Uh, in Muslim tradition, Muhammad uh, one night uh, had gone to sleep, and he was taken by God on a mystical journey to Jerusalem, um, and then upward into the many levels of heaven where he met the different prophets including Moses and Jesus and ultimately finally came into the divine presence. It's sad to see that over the course of history uh, a city holy uh, to the three Abrahamic faiths, holy to Jews, holy to Christians, holy to Muslims, has been a place where altogether too much blood has been shed, where human beings, often enough in the name of religion, have violated God's own commandment uh, to love our neighbor uh, as ourself. 
Some of the historical events that helped to push the different religions apart uh, are certainly the Crusades and the Spanish Inquisition. Um, during these times, we have lengthy, ongoing, very bloody conflict uh, between the two religious groups. Um, during the Crusades, uh, we typically hear about that as being a conflict between Muslims and Christians, but the Jews also got caught in the crossfire and in many cases were slaughtered alongside um, the Muslims by the Christian Crusaders. So we speak about the Crusades, the misguided medieval Christian effort to reconquer the Holy Land that resulted in altogether too much bloodshed. A bloodshed not only of Muslims and of Jews, but as of Christians as well, Christians whom the Crusaders didn't even recognize as Christians. During the Spanish Inquisition and the Reconquista of Muslim Spain by uh, the Roman Catholic monarchs Ferdinand and Isabella, um, there was obviously a very deep-seated, angry, violent campaign uh, to root out not only those of different faiths, but even those who were not in communion with the Roman Catholic Church. And this really created an atmosphere of fear and violence, um, distrust of anyone with differing religious beliefs, and certainly an atmosphere in which people were unwilling to talk about uh, differences that they had or to challenge what seemed to be the authority of the day. So there's a lot of similarities in the dynamics. And what I divides us mostly today, I believe, is politics is the interest of states and nations and, civil and different ideological groups in manipulating a religion and religious doctrines to preach hatred and division rather than love and unity. Despite the vast common ground that exists between Judaism, Christianity and Islam, the points of disagreement seem to have soured interfaith relations for many centuries. But are there ways to overcome these problems? We will examine some possible solutions when we come back. As we have seen, there are so many similarities found within Judaism, Christianity and Islam, with all three faiths believing in the same basic tenets. Yet it is their differences that put them at odds with one another. What can we do to help make these three faiths come to live peacefully through God's love and guidance? The theological differences between Judaism, Christianity and Islam are not in and of themselves insignificant. We disagree on quite a number of crucial theological issues. Oftentimes, historically, uh, religions have taken the attitude that there is only one single absolute truth, and they have it. Um, and when you have that kind of an approach, it tends to create hostility toward other religions that seem to have competing truth claims. Historically, interfaith dialogue has really consisted more of monologue. Each group comes to the table and says what it believes and hopes that everyone else will agree with it. Um, and it becomes more of a religious competition than it is a religious conversation. All rationality flies out the window and you can say you have your faith, but as we know, very few of us can actually embrace that faith and and take it to the level that it's supposed to be. In a sense, it's just so ironic because these are three religions that really do promote peace. It is very easy to move from saying there is only one God and all other gods are false to saying that it's either my way or the highway. And so when we mix religious dogma and substitute that for religious practice, we emphasize the things that divide us rather than the things that unite us. There is no disagreement that is so significant. There is no doctrinal difference that is so significant that it should ever lead people to violence of words or deeds against each other. Those are distortions of the faith 
But because they're linked with this notion that we're right and you're wrong and the two of us cannot get along because I have to affirm my way or I have to take away your rights, this is what complicates the relationships between those religions. One of the great hopes of the 21st century is that all three religions recognize this as a problem. Um, all religions are well established. They are going to remain here uh, for a long time to come. And it would certainly be more productive for all three of them to learn to work cooperatively together in terms of what they share in common rather than continuing to argue over points about which they will never agree. I would invite people who don't realize the importance of dialogue, who rely on the media sound bites that present inaccurate representations of Islam, inaccurate representations of Christianity, inaccurate representations of Judaism, to take the next step, to look deeper, to understand what the church really teaches about how Catholic Christians need to understand and need to relate to our brothers and sisters who are Jews and to our brothers and sisters who are Muslims. I mean, how can you talk about your own religion if you can, you, you talk about it in a vacuum, you know? You can, but what do you have to compare it to? You know, you really need to be able to, and what better thing to compare it to than two, religion, two other religions that, you know, derive from the same well? Pope Benedict XVI, like his predecessor, Pope John Paul II insisted on the ongoing need for deep interreligious dialogue, and particularly for interreligious dialogue among the sons and daughters of Abraham, among Jews, Christians, and Muslims. Fortunately, around the world, since the Second Vatican Council, Jews and Christians and Muslims have worked very slowly, sometimes just taking baby steps. But a baby step is nevertheless a step forward to understand each other. Conflicting views on the exact nature of God has disrupted relations between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam for centuries. No matter how disturbed relations are between these three faiths, it is our duty as Christians to work towards a time when all God's children can live in harmony. It is, after all, one of the basic commandments of Jesus that we should love one another as he loved us. I'm your host, Carolyn Morrison, and thank you for watching. I hope to see you next time on Mysteries of the Church.